Hi, I'm David Freudberg, host of the Humankind on Public Radio podcast. Each week, we tell stories of people holding on to their humanity amid great challenges, like how climate change has affected lives in Northern California. I've definitely not given up hope, but I do think that this is a moment that's calling upon us to respond, and we can choose to keep going, to kind of have our blinders on and to not change, or we can take the courage to be the immune system of the planet and for each other at this time. And we hear from a wheelchair user in Pittsburgh who had studied mechanical engineering in college. You know, after having the spinal cord injury, it was actually my doctor who said, have you ever considered rehab engineering? Um, and I didn't even know that was a thing. So that's, that's why I ended up here. We aim for the highest part of people and their stories will uplift you. Please join us for the Humankind on Public Radio podcast. From MCIE. You know what has been and still is a huge buzzword in education right now? Equity. And our guest this week unpacks what it means and what it doesn't mean. Stick around to learn more. My name is Tim Viegas from the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education, and you are listening to Think Inclusive, a show where with every conversation, we try to build bridges between families, educators, and disability justice advocates to create a shared understanding of inclusive education and what inclusion looks like in the real world. You can learn more about who we are and what we do at mcie.org. Mirko Chardon is Novak Education's Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer. Before joining Novak, he was the founding head of school of the Putnam Avenue Upper School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mirko's work has involved all areas of school management and student support. His greatest experience and passion revolve around culturally connected teaching and learning, recruiting and retaining educators of color, restorative practice, and school culture. He is also the co-author with Dr. Katie Novak of the best-selling Equity by Design, The Power and Promise of UDL. He is available to provide workshops, seminars, and trainings on implicit bias, microaggressions, UDL, restorative practice, identity, courageous conversations about race, and personal narratives. Here is what we cover in today's episode. Why equity is a complex issue that requires a holistic approach the importance of listening to the voices of students, and understanding why school should be for kids and not adults. Before we get into today's interview, I have some questions for you. Are you feeling disconnected from your loved ones? Do you want to stay in touch without having to be constantly on social media? If so, then Together Letters is a perfect solution for you. Together Letters is a group email newsletter that gathers updates from all of its members and combines them into a single, easy-to-read newsletter for everyone. This means that you can stay up to date with what's going on in your friends' and family's lives without having to scroll through endless feeds. Best of all, Together Letters is free for groups of 10 or less. So what are you waiting for? Sign up today at togetherletters.com and start reconnecting with your favorite people. And now, my interview with Mirko Chardon. Mirko Chardin, welcome to the Think Inclusive podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so, so excited to have this conversation. I've been looking forward to it. So, Mirko, I wanted to have you on because I, I wanted to talk about equity. And the word equity can be a politically charged word. And I know for, the, for MCIE, for the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education, you know, we work with districts all around the country, and some of the districts are in states that have specifically called out the word equity and targeted the word as you cannot talk about it. You, you cannot talk about divisive topics. You can't talk about controversial things. In these districts, they want change. They want to move toward more inclusive practices. They want to implement universal design for learning. And they genuinely want to move forward, but there's a big barrier there, and that, that's the language. So to start us off, we're going we're gonna to solve this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to solve it. But I do <laughs> want to have a conversation and get your thoughts about 
you know, how do educational leaders talk around this issue without it being politically divisive? Sure. Why? Well, I, I, I think the I, one I'll start off by thinking by sharing that I think it's so shameful that, you know, the term and in certain terms, you know, in the context of our society have become, you know, extremely charged, which is fascinating for me because some of the folks who don't want that term to be utilized also advocate for free speech. But, you know, it's a conversation for another day. I, in, in direct response to your question, I think part of what we have to do as educators is to reclaim the narrative of the term, because we found ourselves in a circumstance where there are individuals who are defining and giving definition you know, of the work for us and are essentially making claims that we are doing things that we're not doing and have reframed what equity is supposed to be about. When I work with districts and you know, school communities, even state agencies, when folks talk about equity, the first thing I typically recommend is you know, that you know, the, the, the organization go through a process that begins with concept stabilization. And I say starting with concept stabilization, because if, if we start with concept st- stabilization, we're essentially defining what the terms we utilize mean in our own unique context. And I think when we do that, it allows us to reclaim, you know, what that term means for us, how it applies to our work. I often share with folks an example of, you know, what I mean by how equity can be defined in a powerful way. And I, I typically share the definition that's been coined by Dr. Christopher Emden, which simply states that, you know, equity is hearing someone's voice on what they need and providing them with that. And I, I love how simplistic, mm. but how authentic and how direct that definition is in regards to cutting at the core of what equity is or what equity could be as we think about the work of providing agency and empowerment you know, to our kiddos. I think it's also you know, imperative that when folks think about equity, that you know, granted, in many circumstances, we are talking about providing supports you know, for you know, black and brown scholars who have had disproportionate experiences. But you know, equity is not just a person of color thing. You know, when we talk about meeting the needs of individuals, we're we're talking about everybody. So I I I don't want to get too far off on a rant, but for me, the recommendation is always let's define what this term means in our context. It's a very challenging circumstance to be in if there are external factors that are defining terms or saying, no, when you say this, this is what you mean. If we don't have that lightning rod moment to say, wait, wait, wait. Whatever context you utilize this word in different you know, ways, as it pertains to this school community, we're talking about the kids that we serve here, um, and we're talking about doing things that benefit your children. I think that that's a super yeah. important part but of this work. Would you say that definition one more time? So it's hearing somebody's voice on what they need and okay. then providing them with yeah, that. Yeah, so I, I wonder if if we, you know, for those who are listening and are in the situation where they're like, just can't, it, you know, it's the E word, can't say the E word, you know, <laughs> maybe it really is as simple as, okay, well, you know, let's hear what our learners need, you know, whether, whether they are black and brown, whether they have, whether they have individuals, individualized education program, uh, whether, you know, whatever sort of identity they have, maybe we just need to be listening to learners, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I think if we are going to fix or create educational systems that are worthy of our learners, then we, we really have to wrestle with the adaptive sides of the work. And I know that in of itself is not a taboo you know, word yet, but there are many who will quickly jump to technical fixes and not spend the time of correlating the fact that you know any action that we take as a result of you know, our beliefs, our values, you know, we make certain decisions about kids and programs that we put in place based on how we view our role as an educator, what we think our jobs are supposed to be, you know, how we view our young people and how we view what our role is supposed to be, you know, as it pertains to supporting them. And I think if we really wrestle with some of the adaptive elements of the work, we'll lift up the fact that um, and 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 I'll I'll share a disclaimer that when I say this or make this next comment, sometimes people think that I'm joking or that it's cute, but it, it is a hundred percent true and accurate, at least in my value system, that school is for kids. 
not for adults, that every single adult that is part of a school community, you know, of their own free will and volition, you know, applied for a job, accepted an interview and accepted a job offer where they were committing to being the facilitators of another human being's learning experience. Yet when we get into the reads of talking about you know, priorities at schools and, you know, wrestling with pressures, we often make it into an adult conversation that really revolves around what the adults think that they should do or should not do while, while unintentionally communicating, you know, to our scholars that they have no voice and that school is something that's being done to them rather than for them and with them. And I think it's important that, you know, our educators also take into consideration that when we talk about the school thing, we're talking about supporting, you know, individuals who will soon join our society as decision makers with us. You know, because our kiddos aren't in school for forever. And in the context of our society, once they become 18 and 21, their voices matter just as much as any other adults. And I think if we have a laser light focus, you know, not just on adult preferences, but on our learners and on what the purpose of our educational systems are supposed to be, that that will give us inroads and perhaps having some different types of conversations or perhaps even slowing down our processes so we can make sure that our actions truly reflect benefiting learners um, and not satisfying adult egos. I, I absolutely love what you're saying, Mirko, and I know our listeners are loving this as well. <laughs> I think that the question for us is, where we have educators, this is where, where this is not their mindset, right? Where historically mm -hmm. school, even though it should have been for the kids the entire time, historically, it's the mindset is I have knowledge. I have what you need to know as the learner. I have the curriculum and I am going to impart this knowledge on you. And this is going to make you into the person that I think or as society thinks you need to be. And then you're going to leave our educational system and become a productive member. You know, it's like a lot of people, I, I don't know if a lot, of, I don't know the percentage of people who think this, but I know that there are there, you know, and historically that's how schools mm -hmm. run. But how do we move people to start thinking that school is for kids? Well, yeah, I, I, I think we have to create circumstances. And again, you know, I know I have a, a bias because I think it's, it's, it's all about the adaptive side, us touching values, beliefs, things that sometimes are perceived to be scary. But if we can't reinsert humanity, you know, into the educational process and keep it at the center, you know, we're going to lose sight of everything. And when I say that, I mean, not just acknowledging that this is about taking care of younger humans. But, you know, requiring educators to acknowledge their own humanity as well and understand that, you know, we we are not in an industry in which we deal with static beings or inanimate objects. And if we are going to authentically connect, you know, with our young people, we have to take into consideration, you know, again, our own humanity and value systems, the things that we bring with us. You know, we, we have to think about, you know, in terms of our own working conditions. You know, what's going on in the culture of this environment? You know, is this a space where I can authentically say that I feel like I'm part of an adult learning community or that I am able to continue my own learning, growth, and development? I think even folks who have those rigid perspectives on what they think education is will still, you know, hold on to, you know, those cliche statements that all educators are supposed to be committed to being lifelong learners. Well, then what does that mean? And for you as an educator, not even thinking about your students at this particular point in time, you know, what does a challenging learning journey look like for you? You know, what are things that you need to feel supported and challenged and to be able to feel safe enough to step out of your comfort zone, you know, to make some of those connections that neuroscience is, you know, communicated results and, you know, those neurons in our brains stretching, firing, wiring in new ways because we're wrestling with new information. I think if our educators really wrestle with that and, you know, the fact that when we talk about this learning process, it's not, you know, involving kids in some special mystical, magical thing that only applies to children, but we're really talking about learning what it, excuse me, lifting up what it means to embrace the joy of learning. And, you know, there's a variety of different types of educators who've had different types of experiences who are different types of learners. And if they think as a collective, you know, of 
what it would take to create circumstances that edify and lift them up. And how do we model, you know, that for our young people? I think it'd be a huge game changer. I, I think some of what has, you know, our educational work folks for stagnant is that there are a lot of leaders who are not creating cultures that are supporting their educators and allowing them to really wrestle with the messiness of being human, which means wrestling with vulnerability, which means wrestling with, oh my gosh, there's something crazy that's just happened societally. I have to show up at this job. But, you know, again, neuroscience, you know, my brain has a cognitive load. And if it's full of what I just saw on CNN and social media, they're going to need to be some spaces that, that I can process that so that I am not full of anxiety, you know, making decisions that unintentionally lead to harm because I'm not at my best because, you know, leadership has not created dynamics that have allowed me to feel safe and welcome. See, I actually think some of what we see happening in schools are educators essentially giving back to kids what they have received themselves. And they have this demoralizing, dehumanizing experience, um, although they came in with excitement. You know, I'm going to inspire young people. And when they stepped in, it's almost like that weird, you know, analogy of, you know, not if you like sausage, not going to the sausage factory. School shouldn't be like that. But for so many educators, it has become that. And since it has been that and they have not been poured into and that fire has not continuously you know, been attended to, um, it makes it challenging, you know, to be someone who then is going to have the capacity to do that for not just one individual but several. What, one of the common characteristics that we see with inclusive schools, you know, we visit a lot of schools, but the ones that really stand out and that are doing the work, they're including learner, all learners. They're providing time for general and special education teachers to, you know, co-create, coll- collaborate, co-teach, uh, co-assess. They have fantastic leadership. Their leadership You're describing those leaders. You're describing leaders Mm -hmm. that provide the space for their teachers and educators to be vulnerable, to reflect, to think, to plan. I mean, does it really, is is it like, is it leadership? Is is that really what we're talking about here? I, I think we are. I think we're talking about leadership. I think we're talking about institutional culture. I think we're talking about things that folks in the private sector have realized are of the chief importance, you know, if they are going to be successful and if they're going to have their businesses grow, you know, when things that, you know, haven't been normalized as being at the center as it pertains to education. And, and sometimes, you know, when we talk about leadership, you know, I spent many years, you know, as a building leader um, in a variety of different communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You know, when we talk about leadership, we're not just talking about building leadership. Because those building leaders, although they have a great deal of power, influence, and authority over their individual schools, are essentially, you know, in the role of being middle managers who look up, you know, to district leadership. And, you know, the same process happens, right? If there is some toxic elements or toxic practices or a dehumanizing culture that exists, you know, across the district, then those leaders are deflated. And when they stand before their school communities, they emulate, you know, some of what they've experienced. And, you know, you have this trickle down effect that goes from the supposed powerful individuals, you know, folks see principals as being very, very powerful. But if you have conversations with district principals, you know, they will share, we don't have absolute power. No, I am essentially somebody who was managing a program. And yes, I get it. You know, as far as the community is concerned, it's up to me. But I implement policy that's been dictated by school board, my superintendent, my assistant superintendents. I may have no influence as it pertains to the curriculum because we may have tons of curriculum coordinators and directors. Um, there may be dysfunction amongst all of them. And, you know, I am in this space of trying to communicate this message that I've been mandated to communicate to you to absorb whatever hits need to be taken. Because you don't get to circumnavigate me and just go up the chain of command if there's, you know, a decision that's come down that you don't like. Um, and it's, it's just this really weird circumstance that almost 
And I say this unintentionally, right? Because I can't imagine that anybody intentionally created this, but it almost unintentionally normalizes this idea of being powerless and of being uninspired and of being in survival mode. You know, that success is surviving the experience, you know, opposed to it being, you know, one that revolves around thriving. You know, I don't even think there's a universal conceptual framework of what it means to thrive as an educator and as an educational leader, you know, in the world of 2023. And I think that needs to change because, you know, for those of us who aren't in private sector, I think we can quickly close our eyes, have a conceptual framework, a narrative in our brain of what successful leadership may or may not look like in other industries. But within our own, you know, it's almost like we don't have permission to think in that way. And the models that we have are typically antiquated, right? You know, this is what success looked like 40 or 50 years ago. You know, when the circumstances in the world were very different, you know, we had a very different society. There were very different needs. So although there might be some benefit in looking back, you know, it's it's not an apples to apples. We can just take what the thinking was from that particular point in time and assume that it will even understand or meet the needs of any of the issues that are currently manifesting. What if I'm a principal or a school leader who is just feeling stuck in a system that mm-hmm. is is not inclusive? It, it it's not forward thinking. It's it's stuck in in some old patterns and want to move forward, but don't exactly know how. Do you have any advice for them? I I, I think first and foremost, and I I know in the the world of today, for some this might seem somewhat cliche. But I think going back to their why, you know, why have you made the decision to do this, not in some type of cookie cutter light way that, hey, I want to give back. But, you know, let's really dig in. What was it that motivated you to be committed, you know, to this work in these circumstances? And, you know, you know, when I share that definition of equity being about need, you know, what are the things that that you need? What are the direct things that you need? And you know, is this a space where you can get those things? You know, are there colleagues or other networks that you can connect with that will allow you to get those things and sustain yourself in this space? And if you're realizing that you can't sustain yourself in this space and you can't get those things, then I think one of the best things to do is to start thinking about an exit strategy. Now, in the world of education, an exit strategy is a taboo thing. As it pertains to entrepreneurs and business folks, that's something that should you should have in mind when you first you know develop your business plan. And for me, that really revolves around the fact that you know if our leaders are burnt out, they they don't have the capacity to support you know the educators that are supposed to be under them. You know, we when we get on airplanes, we hear over and over again, you need to put your oxygen mask on first. You no, know, you need to ensure that you're at a place where you're full enough to be able to pour into others. If not, you're just taking up space and it might not be an intentional thing. You know, some of us hit brick walls and we get burnt out. There should be no shame, blame, you know, about that. You know, it just is what it is. And self-care is super significant. And I think there are a lot of leaders who are burnt out, worn out, you know, have been put in positions where they're assuming that they cannot take care of themselves, that you know, they're correlating the idea of being a leader with martyrdom that, you know, my badge of courage or honor is that I'm not spending time with my family. I'm not spending time with my kids. I'm stuck in this building. And, you know, we need to shatter that narrative uh, because, you know, it, it is obvious when we lift it up that that is not healthy. It's not sustaining. It's not inspiring. And it certainly does not lead to anyone having capacity you know, to lift up other individuals if you're drowning, you know, in your current circumstance. I, I want to pivot to talking about inclusive education and universal design for learning. And as a as a way sure. to reimagine, reshape school systems. So a lot of our listeners are educators, school leaders, and they're already at the point where like they've bought in. We need to move forward. We need more inclusive school systems. And maybe they have heard of UDL or maybe they haven't, but they know that it can be Mm -hmm. part of the strategy of reshaping educational service 
delivery. So what do you suggest as kind of first steps for educators who want to change systems and know that UDL is part of it, but maybe they don't know how it fits in? Well, I, I, I think it's all about building that internal capacity. I think if, if educators are interested you know, in UDL, I think there's some great resources that are available in, in the form of online courses that you know, folks can take if they're wanting to you know, kind of dip a toe in. My organization, Novak Education, we have a plethora of different you know, self-directed you know, as well as you know, live facilitated you know, you know, course offerings. I think there's some really fabulous texts that are out there that might be a safe way to wrestle with some ideas. You know, my colleague, uh, you know, Katie Novak, her UDL Now was a great text. You know, our text that we co-authored, Equity by Design, I think that that's another great text to really wrestle with the ideas and to try to make sense of, you know, what is this framework? I also recommend, you know, utilizing social media. There's a lot of hubbub about, you know, what's been going on with Twitter, and I'm not <laughs> going to touch any of that now. But I will say that there are a lot of educators who still, um, you know, connect on Twitter and share resources. You know, in fact, if you utilize the hashtag UDL chat, you'll find tons of questions that educators have raised or shared across the nation. You'll see threads of responses and resources that folks are sharing with each other and essentially utilizing you know, that social media, virtual digital space to network, you know, and particularly, you know, if folks are finding that, hey, I, I don't think I have like-minded colleagues or, you know, it's not necessarily safe enough yet for me to raise this with colleagues. Well, I think taking advantage of social media and those virtual spaces to have the conversations and seek out information. Uh, you know, can be I know for myself that I would not have stayed in public education as long as I did without connecting with other like-minded educators on social media. It, it just, it would have not happened. I, I would have been burnt out way, way, way before. It's very real. It's very real. And I think, you know, in the world that we live in, we have so many resources. And certainly, you know, if we don't have the ability to, you know, locally access networks or information that's held in networks, I think being able to utilize social media you know, can help tremendously and, and also help us to, you know, create some national dialogue about, you know, some of the trends and issues that we're dealing with, you know, within our classrooms and our school communities. You know, for me, as someone who has the luxury of observing things in different schools and different cities, different states, different districts, it's fascinating to see the commonalities. You know, there are many of us who are wrestling with the same issues, the same questions, but are doing it in isolation. And are assuming that it's just us or it's an issue that only exists in our community or only exists in our school because there haven't been those opportunities to check in and hear the voices of colleagues in other spaces who are wrestling with some of the things, who have different entry points, strategies, resources, you know, that could benefit our industry as a whole. You know, if we're yeah, able to see, normalize Social that. media doesn't have to be toxic all of the time. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Merker, do you have any examples? of how implementation of UDL has changed a school system to be inclusive of all learners. You know, y'all at Novak Education have worked with a lot of districts, but I think that for people who maybe just want that extra little nudge to, to move forward with either implementing or learning more about UDL, I think they'd love to hear some stories. Do you have any? Yeah, I, I certainly do. And I, I and I think there's a tremendous level of success around our nation right now of folks who are digging in and who are trying to make this work you know, as real as possible. I think there are folks who are doing it at different levels, different stages to try to move things forward. You know, I think the place you know that I, I'd have the most intimate knowledge of is, you know, actually my former school community, you know, that I founded in the year 2012 and led, you know, for just about a decade. You know, when we began wrestling with UDL, it changed everything for us. And it changed everything for us because we really wrestled with, first and foremost, that UDL is not just about tips and tricks, that it's not about these magical silver bullet strategies that are going to change the world, that it was form first and foremost, you know, about us embracing the fact that it's a framework, you know, a set of principles, beliefs, and values that are supposed to guide our work. And that before we even could wrap our minds around how we do UDL, you know, we had to wrestle with some of the foundational principles that come, you know, with that value system or 
you know, with, um, you know, that, that way of seeing the work first and foremost, you know, wrestling with, you know, veritability is everywhere, not even just amongst the kids, but wherever humans are. And what does that mean in, for us and our relationships as adults, you know, wrestling with asking questions about, you know, what does it authentically mean to have high expectations? You know, it's cliche now for folks everywhere to say all means all, but we know when people say all means all, you know, you look at data and, you know, you, you, you hear the experiences that happen in spaces. We know that that's not the case. So is there any deep thinking that's gone into, you know, what does it mean to authentically have firm goals, you know, and flexible means for folks? And, you know, this notion of being an expert learner, you know, have folks really situated their minds around believing that each and every single one of our young people actually has the potential to operate at that level. And I think that is a fascinating question to wrestle with. And when school communities wrestle with this, if they do it in authentic ways, I think we see magic taking place. Because if we truly, truly, truly acknowledge that we believe that all of our learners have the potential to operate, you know, as expert learners, if we are able to identify and remove barriers, it communicates that we see our roles differently than they're traditionally perceived. Because if we believe that each and every single one of our learners has this innate genius within them, and when I say this, I often like peppering it with, if we're saying all, we're not just talking about the ones you like or the ones who have advocacy outside of school. We're talking about the ones who are kicking your butt and driving you crazy right now. If we're acknowledging that they have this inner genius within themselves, then when we don't see it, we realize that it's not because we're dealing with a bad kid or you know, a kid that does not have potential because we've acknowledged that they all do. We know when we don't see it, it's because there are barriers that are in place. And we know that our role then is not to cast judgment on which kids we think have potential versus kids that we think don't have potential. And I think, you know, when there's school communities that really wrestle with that notion, it changes everything. You have to rethink, you know, what you believe your role is as an educator. You have to rethink, you know, what you believe you know, you're supposed to be doing to facilitate powerful experiences for, you know, young learners. And, you know, when we first began wrestling with this at my, you know, former school community, it, it was fascinating because I think a lot of our folks were under the assumption, me included, that we were doing everything possible in our actions, you know, focusing on these different technical fixes and strategies, everything possible to try to communicate that we believed in high expectations. And we were frustrated, always frustrated, you know, when there were circumstances of students, despite what we would preach, you know, not being able to do some of the things that we believed they could, or there being tensions. And, you know, a lot of the typical, you know, a lot of the typical things that happen in schools. But when we really wrestled with, you know, do we authentically believe that all of our learners have the potential to be successful at the highest level? So much so that we don't need to enter in with this mindset that says we need to sift out the good ones from the ones that are mediocre. It was fascinating because we realized if we really, really believe this, then there's certain practices that should be showing up, you know, in our classrooms on a regular basis. We should be planning in a certain way. There's certain types of conversations we should be having with young people that communicate, you know, in the words of John Dewey that, you know, school is not a rehearsal for life. It's real life. And that they're supposed to be at the center because we're supposed to be developing within them this sense of self-efficacy and independence because they're not supposed to be in school forever. And we are certainly not supposed to be their brains or the individuals who are carrying, you know, the cognitive load for them. You know, it's not what happens when you go to the gym, right? Like a trainer doesn't (laughs) lift the weights for you. They coach you through it. But we really have to wrestle with this mindset value system piece to take into consideration you know, how we enter and to ensure that we're not unintentionally manifesting as barriers. And I think there are many of us, me included, before wrestling with this and committing to wrestle with this on a regular basis, I unintentionally showed up as a barrier because something that I held with me was that I always believed that my kids need me and that they were always going to need me. And there was this little selfish thing going on inside of me that was, I wanted to feel needed by the kids. I wanted to feel needed by the faculty. When we enter into that mindset, you know, it, it's easy for us to create circumstances that result in our students, and if we're a leader, our teachers having to have a sense of dependency upon us. 
And that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be coaching. We're supposed to be facilitating, you know, this move towards growth and development. That means that we need to enter into spaces of vulnerability. We need to enter into spaces where we're releasing, you know, some control, you know, in our classrooms and in our school communities, our adult communities to provide opportunities for voice and feedback so we can be sure that we are actually you know, operating in a way that communicates that the work is about the recipient of the service. See, I, I, I like saying to educators that we need to be cognizant of the fact that we're in a service industry. And I say that with a smile because sometimes when I say it, folks will look at me, be like, what are you talking about? But that's what we have, right? We deliver an educational experience, a service, which means we have customers and clients, not ones that we make money off of, but individuals who are the direct recipients of that service. And I think when folks really dig into UDL, at least this is what happened at my former school community, we realize that we have to have laser light focus on that. You know, what is going to be the impact and how are we consistently measuring impact, not just from our lenses, but from the lenses of those who are receiving this service. And it completely transforms everything because you can't do that if you're not ensuring that there are multiple opportunities to gather the voices of others. And when you get the voices of others, that means you get real strong critical feedback. You know, you hear that you've made mistakes. You hear that you've done something that has been hurtful to someone. And you have to wrestle with that, you know, not with shame or blame, but acknowledging that despite what your intentions were, you may have made a mistake and that that's okay. See, I think when folks don't wrestle with these frameworks that I believe are connected to that human experience, it's easy for us to hide behind these false personas, which really, really make, you know, our school communities super impersonal, you know, for the adults, you know, and the young people. For w- when listening to learner voices, I'm, I'm wondering, and for those systems that are working through UDL, and implementing UDL, do, you, do you ever hear from learners that they, they want, I don't know, s- specialized, I don't know if I'm saying this right. I'm I'm thinking about I'm thinking about gifted and talented education, quote unquote. I'm thinking about learners with mm-hmm. disabilities because uh, one of the things that we as a MCIE and and advocates for inclusive education talk about a lot is that learners need to have access and be learning in the same spaces, right? Absolutely. But when we're listening to to learners, I wonder if if we ever come across learners be like, I I want something different. Does that ever come? Does that ever come out? So, in 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 my own experience, mm-hmm. I have not encountered that. At the same time, you know, I think you know it, it absolutely could come out that there are learners who may say, "Hey, I want something different," or "This is not meeting my needs," or "I have certain passions that you know may be very unique," or "There are certain experiences that you know I am looking for that may be very unique," and I think that that's okay. Because again, you know, we're supposed to be developing this sense of self-efficacy um, and we're supposed to be developing this sense of independence so that when our learners leave us, you know, they are truly ready, you know, for the world outside of school. It's, it's one of the things that frustrates me so much when I see the how stagnant you know, our educational systems you know, are, and particularly during this time of societal economic turmoil, right? Like, you know, if, if we're worried about the economy, how are we developing and investing and developing the capacity, you know, of our future workforce so they can meet whatever the societal needs are to keep our economy thriving. And if we're not connecting those dots, we're missing the mark on what the educational experience is supposed to be. It's not babysitting and it's not school for the sake of school. We're supposed to be providing these skill sets so that, you know, these children can walk out of our doors and contribute to society. And I, I think that that has become kind of cookie cutter and kumbaya. You know, folks like saying that, but don't connect the dots on what that means. That means that you have a young person in your class that might be your doctor one day. They might be your dentist. That's scary for some folks thinking, wow, these kids that I'm working with might actually enter into spaces in the society where they have some power and influence over me. You no, know, I've been in the game long enough to have those experiences where I've run into young people and not just the ones I've had good relationships with. You know, where I've been in extreme moments of vulnerability and really had, you know, a gut checky moment. Like, oh my gosh, she's the phlebotomist. Is she going to like stab (laughs) me in the veins a bunch of times? Because I was not at my best when I was working with her. And, you know, how do I take that moment 
that micro moment and that anxiety and wrestle with, I need to do better when I'm standing before these young people because I'm not effective in any way, shape or form if I am afraid if one of them actually gets to a place of success. And particularly if it's someone who's gotten to a place of success that I didn't believe in. And that, that really hits home for me because I, I'm an individual who was expelled from three schools when I was in middle school. I'm an individual who had really horrific experiences in school before I turned around. And, you know, I often joke with folks that I have definitely been the direct supervisor and evaluator, you know, of educators who were kind to me and certainly ones who freaked out when they realized that I was going to be their boss or that I was the one who was the chair of the interview committee when they were coming in. And if that is our reality or there's the possibility of that, we need to do better and do something different. That could get real, real fast. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Well, in the, in the time we have left, thinking about our audience, thinking about you know, educators who are interested in, in moving this education forward, is any, any sort of other thoughts that you want to make sure that, that people walk away with? I, I think that I think it and it's it's I I it's almost shameful to say this, but I think it is so imperative that we really lift up and normalize that school is not about any of us, that it's about the kids and that the kids are the recipients of our service. And that when we as adults receive service, we have some extreme expectations. You know, we expect that our voices are heard and that our voices are validated. We also expect that service providers are actually able to do the things that they say that they're supposed to do, right? Like, you know, in the community, if you're bringing your car to a mechanic and that mechanic has a reputation for not being able to fix brakes, they're not going to be in business. Um, you know, if we go to restaurants and we let folks know that we have particular preferences or allergies and they're not willing to take that into consideration, they're not going to be in business. You know, as it pertains to school, that's typically not the case, though. Because it's very easy for us as educators to say, these are kids. We don't need to listen to them. This is what I have. This is what it's going to be. Or this is the best that I can do. Yet, you know, five minutes after the clock, you know, somebody rolls into Applebee's. And if that waiter is not doing what they're supposed to be doing or isn't delivering service or being kind, they're walking out. They're frustrated. There's a Yelp review. Maybe someone's talking to a manager. <laughs> we have to understand that when our yeah. kids are with us. They're the ones who are sitting looking at us like, wait a second, you keep saying it's all about the children, but you know, in your actions and in this atmosphere, it doesn't feel like that. And, and we need to be mindful of that. It's one of the reasons why so many kids disengage. I often say that our, our kids know when, whether we're being, whether it's essential or not, they know when we're being fake. And they know because they're with us for six to eight hours a day, 180 days a year, and they watch us. They know what our facial expressions mean. They know what the tone of our voice and our body language means. No, you don't have to be an educator who has ever said anything egregious to a young person to have kids know that you don't believe in them and don't have your back because they watch and study and understand your mannerisms. And, you know, there's an old school saying in education, more is caught than what is taught. And we need to be mindful of that because sometimes what shuts down our learners is the hypocrisy that they see over and over again when they step into the school setting. And I think we need to have the courage to be authentic. And our leaders need to have the courage to, you know, create cultures that celebrate, you know, the full diaspora of all the identities and perspectives of the adult learners, you know, who are their employees and staffs. Now, when we do that, we create thriving, healthy communities that we can invite our young people into. See, a lot of educators don't realize our youth are the transient residents of our school communities. They come and go. When you get a job there and you say you've been there for 10 years, you no, know, that's your community. You no, know, you're there for at least half your day every day. What happens in that space is stuff that you allow to have happen in that space. The kids come in, they cruise out, and another group comes in. So we need to be the keepers of that community and ensure that it's thriving and healthy for us. So that when our young learners come in, they can experience something that's also thriving. Yeah, I, I think there's there's a misconception sometimes, especially with new educators, that building community is an afterthought. It's mm. I need to be making sure I'm teaching what I'm supposed to be teaching, like curriculum wise, or I need to be making sure my classroom management is A, B, C, X, Y, Z. But I think you don't get to the point where you have 
a healthy classroom uh, without building community and without investing in your learners and without taking care of yourself, right? Absolutely. 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 And I think there's so many of us who we, we, our focus is on intent and it's not on impact in any way, shape or form. And you know, this is something else that I will, it's, you know, it's a quote from John Dewey from years and years ago, but it's so relevant. You know, that you cannot say, you know, that you've taught anybody anything if there's no evidence of learning taking place. And there's so many circumstances. I think you're talking about younger educators who are like, I just need to follow this curriculum guide and give this stuff to them. Just because you've talked about something or you've put something in front of somebody doesn't mean that it's actually been absorbed in their brain, does not mean that it's in long-term memory, does not mean that they've understood it. And again, I'll liken it to you know, what it's like when we deal, when we're the recipients of service in other spaces. You're not having the plumber come back to your house who can't stop the pipes from leaking. And there are many of us who say that we're teaching and we're working hard, but if the kids aren't learning, who do we teach? And I know that's a scary thing to wrestle with, but you know, I, I think we have to you know, get right to the heart of the matter. You know, if, if at any given point in time, we think we've delivered quality instruction and, you know, we see through student work or assessments that more than 50 or 60 percent of the kids don't have the concepts, we can't move on. We didn't actually teach it to them. We made an attempt to, but that attempt wasn't successful. See, we typically, and, it, and it's a shame, we typically correlate attempts at teaching with success. And that's not the case, right? Like e- even in the athletic world, if I attempt to get a touchdown, but I don't get it. I can't say, hey, we ran the play. Give us props. It's not till I get into the end zone. You know, if I say I'm attempting, you know, three pointers, but I'm just tossing up air balls, my form might be pristine, but I'm just tossing up air balls. Are they going around the rim and popping out? I don't get points of credit for that. <laughs> you know, people acknowledge my effort, but then there's also a sense of, you know, if you're really trying to get those buckets to fall, you need to keep, you need to keep working at it. You're not quite there yet. You know, commend your effort, but keep working on it and you'll get there. Many of us just hang our hats on. I showed up. I tried. Oh, I, I, I did heard it. that a lot. I heard that a lot <laughs> when I was in schools. I also heard a lot of let's just get him to school, feed him and send him home. <laughs> mm. Well, that, well, that's why I say I think the, the adaptive side, you know, of the work is in and and we don't spend time with the adaptive side because we typically say that there's pressure, there's politics. We don't have the time to sit and think. If we're not actually thinking critically and reflecting, then we are just blindly, you know, running a race and we're not even being that intentional about it. If we don't have these moments and these opportunities to stop and question, well, you know, what is the purpose, you know, of, you know, this educational experience? What is the purpose of schooling? Is it babysitting? No, what what you just framed is, you know, we're just getting them in, we're feeding them and sending them home. That sounds like babysitting to me. That sounds like if that's the case, you know, kids might have a more positive experience if they're dealing with someone who's coming in explicitly as a babysitter. But let's think about what our roles are and what we're doing. And let's really wrestle with the why, not in some like cliche, new aged, you know, we are trying to show that we're enlightened. But just really showing that we have a sense of seriousness of purpose as it pertains to the work. You know, what is our firm goal in any circumstance? Um, and how do we know that we're actually achieving that goal? Marco Chardon, thank you so much for being on the Think Inclusive podcast. We appreciate your time. I'm honored to be a guest. Thank you. Think Inclusive is written, edited, and sound designed by Tim Viegas and is a production of MCIE. Original music by Miles Kredich. Attention school leaders. Did you know that you can team up with the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education to promote inclusive practices in your school or district, regardless of your location? MCIE has partners in Maryland, Illinois, Virginia, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and more joining us in this work. Our goal is to expand partnerships in every state in the U.S. and beyond. The first step is to start a conversation with us. Visit our contact page at mcie.org contact and let us know that you want to transform your educational services to be inclusive of all learners. Also, please mention Think Inclusive in your message to let us know how you found out about MCIE. We can't wait to hear from you.
A special thanks to our patrons, Melissa H., Joyner E., Pamela P., Mark C., Kathy B., Kathleen T., Jarrett T., Gabby M., Aaron P., Paula W., and Carol Q. for their support of Think Inclusive. Thanks for your time and attention, and remember, inclusion always works.